If you turn your Bible to the book of Revelation chapter chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 verse number 7 and 8. Revelation chapter 3 verse number 7 and 8. Uh, about the Philadelphian church. There's a thing that is going around where people take it, take verses of Levitation Church for granted and blame everything. Oh, this is the age we are living in, so nothing will happen. Um, and so, one thing we must understand, if we are faithful, if we hold on to the truth, if we hold on to the Word of God in the King James Version, and continue to preach the Word of God, continue to do what is right, God will suddenly work. Okay? God will suddenly work. And we don't have to give an excuse and say, Oh no, this is a levitation churchy, and that's why this is going to happen. That's the truth. This is a levitation churchy. Christians are going to become lukewarm. The Bible says, when I come, will I find any faith? Okay? Christians will take everything for granted. They will take, the, they will take uh, the word of God for granted. They will take the ministry for granted. They will take church for granted. They will take everything that what, what is in relation to Christianity and to the word of God for granted. Because this is the age. But then the Bible also tells us, if you love me, you will keep my words. Amen? If you love me, you will keep my words. So am I a loving Christian? And am I a serving Christian? If you love me, you will keep my word. So am I serving the Lord? If you love me, you will keep my word. So am I worshipping the Lord? If you love me, I, you will do what, I, what the Bible says. And so am I doing what the Bible is telling me? The problem is not about what the other churches are doing. The problem is not about what dispensation that we are living in or what churches that we are living in. The problem is with every individual that is not willing to allow God to kindle His Spirit within him. That's the problem. Individual. We are... We, we, uh, the problem today in this day and age is Christians have become so comfortable in their comfy... And don't want God to kindle them. And don't want God to work in their life. And so you say, I know, that's a fine. And this is the age, so nothing will happen. And, uh, and I can do whatever I want. Because, you know what, the Bible tells it's going to be cold and lukewarm. But the, the question is, do you delight in the word of God? Do you desire him more than anything else in this world? You see, even in the, you know, you know what, like for example... You know, you know, in a peaceful, in a peaceful valley, I mean, uh, sorry, in a peaceful ocean, where the water does not move, you put a little pipe with inside the water, and you blow the air, what will come? Bubbles will come, right? The bubbles will come. So even in this lukewarm age, even in this cold age, if someone blows, you know, something will move. Amen? And if we allow God to kindle, if we God, allow God to work in our life, our pacific life, our passive life will be kindled and we will be on fire for the Lord. So let's not blame on the Lavadation church age. Let's blame ourselves for, for being like a Lavadation Christian. We as a Christian, we ought to be a Philadelphian Christian. You know what happened during the Philadelphian church age? During the Philadelphian church age, this King James Bible was published. You know what happened during the King Philadelphian churches? During the Philadelphian churches, people, men and women, sacrificed the Lord and committed their lives to become missionaries, to go into the third world part of the world and, and win souls and preach the gospel. During the, in, during the Philadelphian churches, what happened? Philadelphian churches somewhere in the year, in, in 90s, in 1900s, you know? It stopped and then we see from 19th century, uh, from 1900s onwards we see the church has become cold and lukewarm and all this worldliness crept inside the church. But before that we see a great move of God. Great move of God during the Philadelphian churches. Revival flourished when this book was published. Everywhere there was revival. There was revival in Scotland. There was revival in England. There was revival in America. William Carey came to India. Souls got saved. Churches are established. You know now what happened? Uh, when William Carey came to India, he came to Calcutta. He, started, he, 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 translated, he translated the Bible from King James Bible in, uh, from English to 14 Indian languages. 
14 Indian languages. He learned the lesson, studied, he became a pundit, he became a scholar, and he translated. Who, who was he? He was a cobbler. Today what happened? We give excuses for everything. The problem is not the lavadation age. The problem is you and I. You and I. A cobbler sitting on the roadside of England had a desire to go to India and preach and win soul, establish church and destroy the evil nurses. The evil sins of India. He had a desire. The problem today is we have an excuse. In those days they had a desire, they had a delight. In this age we have excuses and reasons for everything. That's the problem. That is the problem. And so what happened? So what happened? The, when William Carey came to uh, Calcutta, uh, there was a, uh, he, he, sta he started a church in Shirampur Sh in Calcutta. You know what happened today in that seminary? What they teach? Once upon a time it was a fundamental Bible believing, King James Bible believing seminary. A church. Today what's happening there? They do not believe in creationism. They believe in evolution. They do not believe. Uh, they do not believe Jesus is the only way. I'm, tell, I'm telling you the truth. In Shirampur, in Calcutta, a college which William Carey started, a Baptist missionary who came to India from England. Today, they no longer believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. They believe in all religion. They believe in all version. They believe in all holy scriptures of all religion today. That's kind of a. Christians we have because we have excuses for everything today they had desire and delight for the Lord what happens when you work hard and no results come and no appreciation comes verse number 8 I know thy works you see many a time we say brother but I'm working hard I'm doing all that I can I'm, I'm trying to do all that I can to bring glory to God I don't want to be a passive Christian I want to be an active Christian I mean I'm getting involved I'm working hard I'm praying I'm on my knees I'm studying God's word I'm reaching out to people uh, nobody appreciates me nobody sees nobody uh, nobody even uh, bothers about saying a good words to me and Jesus says I know thy works amen See, it doesn't matter what people say or people doesn't say. What matters is what Jesus says. Amen? Amen. What matters is Jesus says. But to, the question comes again, what will Jesus say to you if he comes tonight? Will he say, I know thy works or he says, I know thy excuses? Will he say, I know thy, thy, you know, thy desire and thy delight or he says, I know about your excuses? You think about yourself and you put this question to your own self. Where do you stand today if the Lord will put you on the scale? If the Lord will put you on the scale, where will you stand today? Will God say, I know thy works or will he say, I know thy excuses? That's the question that you know and only you can answer it. And God knows it. And you got to be faithful in answering that question tonight. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Amen? It is not about the quality, quantity, it's about the quality. It's not about how many people you win, it's about what kind of people you are. It's, about, uh, it's not about how many people are in the church, it's about how many are saved in the church. Today we, we, we look around in this television, we see about thousands of people are saved. I mean, sorry, thousands of people have been uh, in the church and uh, thousands come for meeting and thousands and thousands and millions. And then reports go around, you know, uh, millions came for the meeting and thousands got saved. Banihan came the last time to Mumbai and he, he said, you know, big headline, millions came for the meeting and thousands got saved. Where are they today? Where are they today? Because when, uh, when an altar call was given, everybody came in front. And so everybody were counted as saved. Why? They came forward and they prayed a prayer. Everybody came because of emotions. 
They thought Bani Hin will pray and everybody will get healed, so they came. Where are they today? The percentage of Indian Christianity is still 0.15. I'm talking about really born again Christian. The others are to to totally 2.5, still not growing. Because we have an excuses in India today. We have an excuses all over the world today, in our day and age, in the churches today. The question is, does Jesus know your world or he knows your excuses? When he comes, will he say, I know thy works, or he'll say, I know your excuses. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue. Of... Okay, so we, we, we will stop there in verse number 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou is a little stand and has kept my word. Are you faithful with what God has given you? You may not be a great preacher like some of the famous preachers today. But God has given gifts to each and every Christian today. Every individual has gifts. Are you faithful with what God has given you? Do you really use that for God's glory or are you living for yourself? Remember, in this day and age, uh, you see, there's this guy, who is this, Benedict XVI, the Pope of the Catholic Church. That's just a fulfillment of the scripture. And that tells that the coming of the Lord is very soon, and you better be serious about this. Turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 17, verse 10, and read that. It is not a surprise thing that Benedict XVI just uh, gave her, uh, told about, uh, declared about his resignation. No, it is a fulfillment of the scripture. And we are seeing it in our own eyes. Revelation chapter 17 verse 10. What it says. Uh, yeah. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. And one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh. He must continue a short space. He must, he must continue a. Short space. This fellow did not fulfill it. He just continued a short space. The next Pope that is going to come will be the final, if I am not wrong. The next Pope who will be coming will be the final Pope and then the son of sin will be revealed. And before that, the rapture is going to take place. Are you ready for it? It is fulfilling right in your eyes. He continued for a short space. Now he's going to resign. And the final Pope is going to come and then comes the Antichrist. Before that will be the rapture. Before the Antichrist comes. Today you cannot go and buy a cylinder without your Aadhaar card. You have to go and do all your paperwork. Why? Because in the Aadhaar card they took your retina, they took your thumbprint, they took your fingerprint. They're getting ready for everything. I'm not saying you should not do that. Okay? As long as rapture does not take, we are doing it. It's only during the time of tribulation that is going to be implemented. But we are living... And seeing everything in our eyes and we see the scripture being fulfilled, the prophecies being fulfilled. What are we doing with our Christian life? Are we living for our own self or are we living for the Lord? Because tomorrow when you stand before the Lord, whatever you did for yourself will not be counted. Will be, will be burnt away. It will be no use at all. All what is done for Jesus will remain. Are you living for the Lord? Can Jesus say, I know thy works? It's a serious question. I never thought about this. I know thy works. I know thy excuses. It, the Lord just put it in my mind. Will he say, I know thy work? Or will he say, I know thy excuses? Because in all over the world, Christians have become a good excuse, good excuse givers. We have answer for everything today. For everything we have an answer. But will Jesus say to you, looking at your life and looking at your testimony and looking at your work, will Jesus say, I know thy works? This is a church that was faithful. This church was not a big church, but it was a faithful church. This was not a church that was having a big, big meetings and, 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 and celebrating great things. This was a little church, humbly celebrating Christ every day, enjoying Christ every day and being faithful Day by day, they kept the work, they did the work of God, and they kept the word of God. 
I know thy works. You may be saying, brother, I am sincerely doing it. I am sincerely, faithfully, I am living for the Lord. I am working every day for the Lord. If that is the, then, then the Lord says, I know thy works. Amen. We don't need some appreciation from people around. If the Lord appreciates us, that's all that counts. But if God puts you on scale tonight, will He say, I know thy works? Or is He going to say, I know thy excuses? And if He says, I know thy excuses, you are finished. You are in trouble before the Lord. You'll be ashamed before the, great, before, the great, before the judgment seat of Christ. Because of the life that you lead. Of course you'll go to heaven if you're saved. But when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be ashamed. And so we let, let, us, let us ponder over it. Let's think about it. Let us, let us see what am I doing in this world with the life that I have. God has saved me. God has given me gifts. He has given me talents. What am I doing with what God has given me? Brother, I'm not so talented. You don't have to be talented. But God has given gifts to everyone. What are we doing with the gifts that God has given? That is the question. And so if, if, if the Spirit of God is convicting and speaking to you and you know what your gift is, and if you know that you are not faithful in using your gifts and you're just giving excuse, then why not this evening be an evening of reformation and change? So Lord, here am I. I surrender, I submit myself in the altar before you. I'm not going to be ashamed of anything. I'm, I'm just going to, be, I'm going to be sold out for your cause. I want to live for you. All I want to do is your will. The Bible says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Do you desire to serve the Lord? Remember this, this is a dangerous prayer. Psalm 37 verse 4 is one of the most dangerous things. It cuts on the both the side. In what do you delight? That's the question. Do you delight in the Lord or do you delight in yourself? If you are delighting in yourself, He will give you the desires of thine heart. If you delight in yourself, He will give you the desires of thine heart and you will be in trouble. But if you delight in the Lord, he will give the desires of thine heart and He's going to bless you for that. Where is your delight tonight? Is it in God's word? Is it in God? Is it in God's work? Will He say, I know thy works? Will He say, I, I know the heart? You are faithful. You have been faithful in everything, every little thing that I gave you. You are faithful in, the, in my work. You are faithful in your words. You are faithful in, 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 in obeying the word of God. You are faithful. You love me. And you have been keeping my word. I love you so much. Or will he say, I know your excuses. This is fearful, my friend. This is fearful. If you delight in yourself, He will give you the desires of thine heart and you are in trouble. But if you delight in God, if you delight in the Lord, He will give you the desires of thine heart and you will be blessed. The choice is yours. What do you want to do with your life? The choice is yours. You have been saved. Now what do you want to do with your life? When you were not saved, the Lord pleaded. Say, come. The bridegroom, the bride says, come. The Spirit says, come and, and take the water of life uh, uh, freely. But after you got saved, God commands you. And says, take up your cross and follow me. Will you do that? Are we doing that? Taking up my cross is my difficulties, my problems, my excuses, my sickness, my everything that I... Uh, I, I have an excuse, but I may, am I taking my cross and following Him? Because if you are a disciple, then that is all you got to do. Take up your cross and follow Christ. Just, you know, there is a song, follow me, follow me. Live your fishing nets and boats upon the shores. Live the seeds that you have sown. Live the nets that you have sown. Live the fishing, you know, and follow me. Live everything and follow me. Now that is for disciples. Are you a disciple of Christ? 
Is Jesus the Lord of your life? You know, we all are satisfied. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Lord, I gave you my soul, but don't touch my body because I want to live with my flesh. I gave you my soul, that's it. You know, we say, you know, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I gave my soul to Jesus, as if like you was very worth it. As if our soul and our spirit is so much worth. No, He moved with compassion and He saved us. Amen? Amen. And He expects that you and I live for Him now. With this body. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. It is not that I live. It is not, I, it's no longer I live. It's Christ liveth in me. And the, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live for, for the, in, by faith. What's that? Book of Galatians? What it says? Book of Galatians? Huh? 2.20. 220. Yeah. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God. Do you believe that God can take care of everything in this life for you? The life that you live in flesh. Or you think that you need to help God in taking care of everything. Or you believe, do you have faith that God can take care of everything in the life that you live in flesh? Christians are trying to help God right now. We are trying to help God in the flesh. God doesn't need our help. God wants your submissiveness, absolute surrender. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Do we give ourselves to him? Is Jesus the Lord of our life? Is Jesus the one who controls our flesh today? Or we say, I gave you my soul, I gave you my spirit, you saved me, you are my savior now. That's fine, don't touch my body now. Let me live as I want. That is what we have in church today. Saved but not converted. Saved but not converted. We have saved but we don't have disciples. Will Jesus says, I know thy works. He says, I know thy excuses. Don't try to help God with your life, with your school, with your education, with your job, with your family, with your business. Don't try to focus. Today we have a ministry like, focus on the family, focus on the youth, focus on the church. We don't need to focus on family and focus on church and focus on... We need to focus on Christ and all things will fall in places. Amen? Looking unto Jesus. Who is the author and finisher of our faith. You don't look somewhere else. Look unto Jesus. The, um, the, the Charles Persian, the great Baptist preacher. Uh, at the age of 19, because of the snow, he couldn't go to his Baptist church. And he went to a reformed Methodist church. And there were not many people. Because of snow, nobody came. And the one teen man was a tailor. Stood on the pulpit that day because the preacher did not come. And he did not know how to preach and he never had preached before. But he took the Bible from the book of Isaiah and said, Look unto me and he be saved. That's it. Charles Spurgeon looked unto Jesus Christ and called upon him and he was saved. Amen. What are we looking at today? Are we looking at Jesus Christ? Are we focusing on Jesus Christ? Uh, is our focus on f our Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, or upon ourselves? The question is, whom are you focusing upon? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't try to help God. Don't try to help God to bring success in your life. Let God bring success in your life. There's only one way of bringing true success in your life. That is in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. How? By meditating upon the word of the Lord day and night. And by, and by that, what do you do? You will have good success and prosperous life. Amen? If you have prosperity and good success in any other way, that's not from Christ, but from yourself, which will be burnt. 
But if God is the one who gives you success, that will last forever. Because the book of Revelation says there's one thing that will follow you when you go to heaven, and that is your works. With what you did in your flesh. The question is, upon whom are you focusing? The question is, who is your delight? The question is, does God know thy works or thy excuses? Let us be like the Philadelphian church. Little strength, but yet keeping his word. Being faithful. So when Christ comes, that he may find us faithful, no matter what time we are, no matter what time he comes, that he may find us occupied. Occupied in his work. Don't focus on yourself, don't focus on your business, don't focus on your job, don't focus on your whatever. Do what is right. Live for the Lord. Few days to go. The scriptures have been fulfilled. Don't you fear? Don't you have some fear in your heart? Fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you have wisdom tonight? Fear God. Don't worry if the world does not appreciate you. If you live for the Lord, if you live right, the Lord appreciates and He says, I know thy works. Amen? Even little, yet you keep my word. Shall we pray?